suspiró mi ocid, que mucho había grandes cuidados. Fabló mi ocid, bien e tan mesurado. Grado a ti, señor, padre que estás en alto. Esto me han vuelto mios enemigos malos. Allí piensan de aguillar, allí sueltan las riendas. A la eshida de vivar, o vieron la cornella diestra. Entrando a Burgos, o vieron la siniestra. Metió mi ochid los hombros, engrameó la tiesta. Al Brits y Álvar Fáñez, cachados somos de tierra. That was from the first page of the manuscript of the Song of the Cid, or El Canto de Mio Cid. And it's the first page of the document that we have, of the manuscript that we have, but like most of the text that we've read so far in this class, uh, it is a fragment. We're missing a page or two before this that explains why El Cid, uh, Rodrigo Diaz, is being exiled by King Alfonso. We're never told that in the poem. Maybe it uh, occurred on the actual first page, which is now lost to us, but we're missing uh, some necessary context, some uh, necessary introduction. and. That is uh, been sort of our one of our ongoing themes in this class. Uh, we have fragments of clay tablets. We have individual pieces of uh, parchment and vellum manuscripts uh, from everything that we've read so far, and uh, those uh, fragments leave us with gaps that we've got to fill in with our own knowledge. Uh, and we try to use historical knowledge, historical context to the extent we can, uh, but sometimes we uh, have nothing but uh, uh, non-historical context, personal context. Uh, but the backstory as to why El Cid has been sent into exile is not the only missing context for most of us uh, reading this uh, medieval epic. Uh, the, the whole history of medieval Spain is something that we in the United States and even in Texas uh, tend to not learn in, in high school when we're learning the history of, of Anglo-Saxon England, the Anglo-Saxons and, and the Jutes. Um, you know, invading uh, the, the island of Britain. We, we have a lot more background knowledge of the, the history of England than we do the history of Spain. But that's unfortunate because the history of Spain is a very interesting one. It's uh, uh, especially medieval Spain, the Spain out of which the, the poem of the Cid, or the Song of the Cid is emerging. So let's go way back in Spanish history to the, the s eighth to sixth centuries uh, before the Common Era, BCE. Uh, at this time, we have a, a population of people living on the Iberian Peninsula, and that is uh, modern day Spain and Portugal. Uh, and these people we'll refer to as the native Iberians. Uh, their descendants are still there, the Basques of, uh, of Spain uh, speak a language that is not Indo-European, that is it's not related to the, uh, the languages of modern uh, Spanish or uh, German or English or uh, even Slavic and Greek. Uh, these are all Indo-European languages, but uh, we can trace their origins to a, a common origin, but we cannot trace Basque to that common origin. So that, that uh, tells us that the Basque have probably been there a very, very long time. Uh, and around the, uh, the eighth to sixth centuries uh, before the Common Era, uh, we have uh, the Celts or the Gauls who, uh, contrary to popular belief, did not emerge in, in Ireland or Britain. Uh, their uh, ancestors came to Britain and Ireland from uh, modern day uh, Germany and, and France, uh, these areas north of the, uh, the, the Alps. And they, before they moved into, at least into Ireland, they moved into the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and it's actually from the Iberian Peninsula that they seem to have migrated, or at least one uh, migration uh, of a Celtic population went to Ireland. So the Irish Celts actually came from Spain, uh, or they came from uh, Western Europe by way of Spain. And they leave their names uh, in places like Galicia and in the port of Galicia. This was the, the Latin name for uh, this uh, port in the, the area of Iberian Gaul or Galicia. So Portus Galicia is where we get the name Portugal. Uh, and the north of Portugal on the Atlantic coast of Spain is, is still a territory referred to as Galicia. This uh, comes directly from the name for the Gauls. 
around that same time or over those uh, centuries from around 700 to around 500, we also have the uh, Mediterranean coast of the Iberian Peninsula being settled by the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Uh, remember, both of these powers were uh, very accomplished mariners uh, during the, uh, the, the centuries before the Common Era. Uh, they were merchants, they, were, they had great navies uh, to protect those uh, colonies. Uh, they established trade across the Mediterranean, and this was the sort of furthest extent. Remember that they established these colonies all over the Mediterranean long before the city of Rome had been founded. But uh, uh, on this map, you see in yellow the Phoenician settlements, including Carthage. Remember, uh, we talked about this with the Aeneid, that uh, Dido came from Tyre. She's referred to Tyrian Dido, and, and Tyre or Tyre is on the, uh, the, the coast north of Israel, on the, the far east uh, side of the Mediterranean. Uh, but they settled uh, areas all the way to the western end, all the way to uh, the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, while they were doing that, the Greeks were establishing these uh, territories in red, these colonies that are marked in red. And all of those territories would then become points of dispute uh, during the Punic Wars between uh, Carthage and Rome. And this is when Hannibal leads his armies across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar and up through the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, the Carthaginians, who again, remember, are descendants of the, uh, the the Phoenicians. Uh, the Carthaginians are at war with Rome, and instead of just sailing directly across and attacking the Italian peninsula, they go through uh, Iberia. And uh, Hannibal had a lot of allies in Iberia and th that supported him against the Romans, but when the Carthaginians were eventually defeated, that meant that all of those uh, states uh, that had supported them were points of contention. There were battlegrounds all up and down the Iberian peninsula, uh, not just in Rome and not just in Africa. Uh, also remember that the Macedonian Greeks had allied themselves with the Carthaginians against the Romans, and when they were the defeated, uh, those Greek territories as well as the Phoenician territories or Carthaginian territories all fell into uh, under the sway of the Roman Empire. After they uh, took over this territory, the Romans founded the city of Valencia. Uh, this was a, a Roman settlement uh, in the very beginning, and it's, some it's a city that's still going to be around, it's still around today, uh, and this is the city that El Cid will eventually conquer and make his own kingdom. Uh, the city of Zaragoza, uh, that name has an interesting history that's a, a, a gradual, uh, that name Zaragoza evolved from the pronunciation Caesar Augusta. Remember, Augustus Caesar was the, the first emperor of Rome. Uh, this city was named after him around the year 12 BCE, and Caesar Augusta late, uh, over the centuries becomes pronounced as uh, Caesar Augusta, Zaragoza, uh, and it still bears that name Zaragoza today. Uh, this is another city that's very relevant uh, to the, the Song of the Cid, part of the geography of the Song of the Cid. After the Roman Empire is uh, sort of fragments and is uh, overrun by the Visigoths, and beginning in the year 410, when the Visigoth king Alaric sacks the city of Rome, uh, it's these territories that the Visigoths move into. Uh, they uh, sort of make a deal with the, the Roman Empire that uh, they'll settle in these territories. Uh, remember, they helped defeat Attila the Hun in uh, modern day France. And uh, in return for uh, defending these areas, they're sort of granted uh, these manors uh, throughout uh, the Roman province of Gaul and Hispania. And so uh, they found the city of Toulouse in uh, modern day France as well as Toledo in modern day Spain. These are Visigoth names and uh, Toledo to this day is also gonna be uh, an important city. Uh, and remember that the Visigoths uh, descended from the very same people uh, from whom Beowulf descended, the, the Geats or the Gauts. They came eventually uh, in the, the remote past. Uh, they came from Geatland in modern day Sweden. And remember that story in the saga of Hrolf Kraki, when Thorir Houndsfoot becomes king of the Goths simply because he's big enough to sit in this giant throne that nobody else can fill. That's how they choose their king. And it seems like a pretty ridiculous way to, to choose a king. Well, unfortunately for the Visigoths, they weren't very good at coming up with a way to choose a line of succession. You know, when one king dies, who's gonna take, it pl to take his place? Instead, they end up just fighting each other frequently. Uh, and this infighting, uh, continues in the Visigothic kingdoms in Spain. So we have some very unpopular rulers that are constantly at war with each other. 
and this ends up weakening the Visigoth uh, hold on, uh, on Spain and France, and it does not uh, instill loyalty of the, the local population. And as a result of this disunity, we have uh, a weakened, sort of fragmented series of kingdoms, or uh, to use our, our previous term, a series of chiefdoms, which are all sort of independently uh, gathered around individual chiefs or individual kings, but there, there's no sort of way to unify these large-scale uh, uh, armies the, the size you would need for, the, say, a nation state. And this leaves them vulnerable to invasions coming from the African continent, uh, starting in the year uh, 711, uh, the uh, Muslim Berber tribes invade from the uh, Umayyad Caliphate. Uh, they come across the Straits of Gibraltar. In fact, uh, the, the name Gibraltar uh, literally translates Rock of Tarif, the name of the Muslim general leading the uh, invasion into uh, Spain. And so just to sort of refresh here, remember that Islam starts on the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, Peninsula, or the Arabian Peninsula, and spreads first into territories of the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, precisely because these two empires were so exhausted from fighting each other that they were left weakened, and they didn't tend to defend themselves uh, from desert frontiers because they didn't think anybody was gonna cross the desert and attack them from that direction, uh, which the Arabs were able to do very successfully. Uh, so the Arabs, uh, Arab Muslims invade the, the Byzantine Levant, uh, modern-day Israel and uh, Phoenicia, they invade uh, the Byzantine uh, territories of, uh, of Egypt, and they, they move all the way through North Africa into uh, an area dominated by uh, a group of tribes that are, like the Arabs, very good at moving very quickly on horseback across uh, very difficult terrain. And they're also very good at uh, sort of making uh, a successful life thriving in uh, dry desert environments. Well, st between the years 711 and 788, uh, these, uh, uh, Arab and Berber uh, Muslims uh, go on what starts out as a raiding mission uh, into uh, Hispania, into these Visigothic kingdoms, and they find themselves far more successful than they thought they would be. They didn't set out to conquer, apparently. They just uh, went into raid and realized that uh, because of the disunity uh, in the Visigoth kingdoms and the fact that the uh, the, the most powerful Visigoth king, whose name was Roderick, uh, he was up in Galicia. He was in the northwest corner uh, with all of his army trying to put down a revolt up there. And so he was about as far away from his capital at Toledo as he could be. So this left Toledo open to attack. And uh, because of this disunity, because of uh, the resentment toward all the, the infighting between the different Visigoth factions, uh, the local population had to choose between remaining loyal to the uh, Christian Visigoths, and by the way, the Visigoths weren't even uh, Catholic Christian. Uh, they believed in a particular heresy, or what the Catholic Church uh, called a heresy. Uh, that belief separated them from their Catholic population, as well as their other uh, religious populations in that area. And so, their, the, the decision for the local people, do we side with Roderick and the Visigoths, or do we accept these new invaders, uh, was kind of an even choice. Uh, you know, some went one way, some went the other. And so, the, the Arab invaders had an easier time uh, winning over uh, these individual cities than they thought they would. And they continued to push uh, up through the Pyrenees Mountains into the Frankish Empire before they were finally defeated and sent back across the Pyrenees Mountains at the Bottle, Battle of Poitiers. So that left the southern uh, two-thirds, uh, basically, of Spain uh, as part of this uh, Muslim uh, union of kingdoms uh, that's usually referred to as Al-Andalus. And besides all of the people of Greek descent, of Phoenician descent, of Carthaginian descent, uh, uh, Visigothic descent, uh, and Celtic descent, you've also got now a range of religions. You have Christians of, of different uh, denominations, we'll call them, although some of these were considered uh, heretical, uh, living uh, and worshiping in the same cities as uh, people of Catholic or Orthodox uh, faith. You, now you, you also now have uh, uh, Muslims, and Besides this, we also have a significant Jewish population, which is left over from the, the time when it was a Roman uh, territory. And so after the Jewish diaspora in the uh, first century uh, of the Common Era, a lot of uh, Jews were uh, forcibly removed from Jerusalem, and a lot of them came to this uh, other Roman territory. Um, so you have uh, different types of Christians, uh, different types of Muslims, and you have a Jewish population as well, which 
forces Al-Andalus to become a relatively open society. Uh, even when it's under Muslim rule, uh, Christians are allowed to worship at Christian churches, Jews are allowed to worship uh, at uh, Jewish temples. Uh, they do have to pay a sort of tax or, you know, here's my, the payment I have to pay for not being Muslim. So it wasn't all total egalitarian, it wasn't a, a totally uh, uh, open society. But it was uh, much more open, religiously open, than most other places in Europe were at this time. And so that brings us, uh, Al-Andalus exists in one form or another, ruled over by one caliphate or another, uh, until the 11th century when uh, the, the time of, of El Cid. Uh, but to understand El Cid, uh, not only do we have to understand the population and the, the, the religious, ethnic, uh, political background, we've also got to understand the particular infighting uh, between three brothers in particular, or rather two brothers in particular, that's going to help us understand who Rodrigo Diaz is and why he is in this antagonistic relationship with uh, King Alfonso. So even though we can divide Spain or uh, between Al-Andalus, the, the Muslim controlled area, and the Christian controlled uh, areas at the, uh, the northern uh, end of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, each of these areas is uh, fragmented into different kingdoms. Uh, these different kingdoms are frequently referred to as Taifa. Uh, it's a, a kingdom that is at war with the, the neighboring kingdom, even though they're the, the same religion. Sometimes they're at war, sometimes they, have, they broker a, a temporary peace so that they, the two of them together can uh, go and fight uh, the uh, a third kingdom. Uh, sometimes uh, a Muslim kingdom will unite with a Christian kingdom against another Muslim kingdom. Sometimes a Christian kingdom will unite with a Muslim kingdom against another Christian kingdom. Uh, and because of this constant fighting between these different factions and these different geographic regions, this is referred to as the fitna, or the time of troubles. Uh, your, uh, um, Maria Rose Minical, in your introduction in the, uh, the Burton Raphael uh, edition, a translation of Song of the Cid, uh, compares this to the Wild West and uh, the American uh, 19th century. And that's a, that's a good comparison. There's uh, no single law out there. There's, uh, you know, it, it's one uh, faction against another. And at the time of El Cid's birth, the most powerful faction was the kingdom of Castile Leon, which uh, had been united by uh, a guy named Sancho. Uh, and, and Sancho had uh, inherited uh, the kingdom of Castile from his father, but his brothers, uh, his brother Garcia inherited the, the territory of Galicia, uh, his brother Alfonso uh, inherited the territory of Leon, and Sancho was not content to just rule over uh, one of these uh, territories. Uh, he wanted the other two as well, so he actually uh, goes to war with his brothers. He uh, takes Galicia from Garcia, he takes uh, Leon from Alfonso, and he sends Alfonso into exile in uh, Muslim-held Toledo. And one of the reasons Sancho was so successful was because of this uh, young soldier of his, and, and I'm talking young, he was a teenager uh, at, at the time, and that is uh, Rodrigo Diaz from the city of Vivar. This is who will later be known as El Cid. And uh, El Cid is a very uh, loyal and very strategically uh, expert uh, uh, soldier and later a general. And uh, he helps Sancho uh, retake these territories from his brothers. But as part of this uh, family tradition, uh, it seems, uh, uh, Alfonso seems to have had his brother Sancho assassinated by one of Sancho's own soldiers uh, and probably paid by Alfonso, but uh, such that Alfonso could pretend he had nothing to do with it. And after Sancho is killed, uh, Alfonso then inherits the entire kingdom. And that means he also inherits El Cid and all of his, uh, his brother's army. But of, as you might imagine, if there is suspicion that your new king assassinated your old king, the, especially the old king to whom you're uh, very much loyal to. Uh, you can imagine that El Cid and, and Alfonso aren't gonna get along very well. Uh, and yet El Cid really has no choice. He has to serve uh, his uh, new king, uh, Alfonso, uh, unless there's some way he could prove uh, this murder and then have Alfonso removed from the throne, which is uh, unlikely. Now Alfonso realizes that there's uh, a threat in El Cid. El Cid is someone who is uh, the, the key to his brother's success and if you get this general uh, uh, turned against you then uh, your position as uh, king is, is uh, unstable. 
so he actually sends off El Cid to uh, do diplomatic work, sometimes to exact tribute from uh, some of the other kingdoms, both Christian and Muslim. Uh, so he'll send El Cid and, and an army uh, down to, in one case he sends them down to the kingdom of Seville, uh, which is a, a Muslim kingdom. And while El Cid is there collecting tribute from the king of Seville to uh, be paid to Alfonso, another uh, Castilian noble, uh, Count Garcia Ordonez, who we see referred to repeatedly in the text as my Cid's enemy. Uh, we, we're never told why he's uh, El Cid's enemy, we're just told that he is. Uh, but uh, we look at the history, we see that uh, at the same time while El Cid been, was sent down to Seville, uh, Count Garcia Ordonez was sent down to Granada with some other Castilian nobles, and it, uh, at that time while they were down there, Granada invaded Seville. Uh, this might have been planned, it might not have, we, we don't know exactly, but it sort of seems like El Cid was sent on a, a suicide mission. He was supposed to be down there when Seville was, was overrun, or maybe he was supposed to uh, uh, just sort of sit back while, uh, maybe he was just a decoy for Alfonso while these other nobles uh, got the Kingdom of Granada to go invade Seville. But uh, if that's the case, he never got the message and he actually helped the King of Seville defeat Granada. And that meant he also helped uh, defeat Garcia Ordonez on the battlefield. So here's where we see this uh, uh, previous antagonism between uh, Garcia Ordonez and El Cid that shows up as, as extremely important in the text of the Song of the Cid, but is never fully explained. And because of this, uh, Alfonso exiles El Cid. Uh, this is the historical reason for his exile, and it's clear that Garcia Ordonez is behind this. He's, he's telling Alfonso that El Cid has defied you or shown himself to be a threat uh, by attacking these, the, the nobles of, of Castile. And uh, for this reason, uh, El Cid is, is given uh, enough time to you know, pack his things and you know, choose his, his loyal followers and, and leave uh, uh, the kingdom of Castile and probably, uh, Alfonso probably thought this was gonna be the end of him. He was just gonna uh, go somewhere else and, and never be a military threat again. But El Cid is, you know, becomes known as the doctor of battle, Compi Doctoris, uh, precisely because this is the one thing he is an expert at. He is not gonna stop fighting. He's not gonna stop being this uh, uh, successful general. Um, so he goes to the Muslim kingdom of Zaragoza and becomes a, a mercenary, uh, but not just a, a you know, an, an ordinary foot soldier mercenary. He's somebody who the Muslim kings recognize as a very accomplished uh, a general. Uh, and the kingdom of Zaragoza goes to war with uh, the kingdom of Barcelona. And El Cid is in the employ of the Muslims in, in Zaragoza, and so he goes to fight this Christian kingdom. And this is where he earns the, the name Said, which is the uh, Arabic term for the Lord or the commander. Uh, your, your superior officer is your Said. And this is where the, the word Cid comes from. Frequently in the historical documents, it's El Cid, the Cid, the Lord. Or in the, the canto, uh, or Cantar de Mio Cid, it's Mio Cid, uh, because it's a term of affection. Uh, it's, it's not just my Lord uh, in the sort of formal sense, but it's uh, somebody to whom uh, these soldiers feel very uh, committed, feel very uh, loyal. Uh, but this is also the origin of the, uh, this is also the, the kernel, the historical kernel of the uh, narrative version where uh, El Cid fights against the Count of Barcelona. Meanwhile, while El Cid is uh, uh, working for uh, various uh, Muslim kingdoms, Alfonso tries to retake Toledo, and he's successful at first, he's very successful, he keeps pushing south uh, and, and conquering these uh, Muslim taifa kingdoms. And so these taifa kingdoms, as much as they dislike each other, they, they try to unify, they realize that if Alfonso pushes down the center, he'll divide them and um, he'll be able to keep them from uh, helping each other out. And so they call for help, uh, they invite the king of the Almoravid Berbers, uh, these, uh, this Muslim kingdom, this large kingdom, it's a, you could call it an empire in North Africa. And as, as much of a, an open society as Al-Andalus had been that had uh, you know, allowed Christians and Jews to continue their own uh, religious practices, had even allowed them to be promoted uh, in, uh, in the government, and in the military, and this sort of thing, the Almoravids were um, much more strict, conservative, fundamentalist uh, jihadists. They sort of ended a lot of these uh, open practices that the Al-Andalusian uh, 
uh, Muslim taifa kingdoms had promoted. But by creating this very authoritarian, hierarchical uh, uh, power structure, they're able to unify a lot more people and a lot more soldiers and use them uh, much more effectively on the battlefield. So they actually defeat Alfonso and defeat him very badly uh, at Toledo. So that sends uh, Alfonso back to Castile and even then, uh, Alfonso realizes this might be the end of Castile. They might just continue to follow him all the way back and, and take over the kingdom of Castile and Leon. So he has to uh, make uh, amends with El Cid. He invites El Cid to come back out of exile if El Cid will help him defend uh, Castile against the invading uh, Almoravid uh, Berbers uh, and, and who were now united with uh, the Taifa kingdoms, uh, the Muslim kingdoms of southern Spain. So El Cid agrees under one condition, and that is any time he takes over a Muslim territory that's not part of Castile Leon, he, he gets to keep that territory. And so Alfonso really has no choice, so he uh, agrees to El Cid's terms. And uh, after El Cid is able to repulse the, the Berber advance, uh, the Almoravid advance uh, to the north, he then uh, turns east and conquers the Muslim city of Valencia, which remember was uh, this ancient Roman city. And uh, he holds Valencia until his death. Now, it's, it's possible that he would have lost uh, the city of Valencia if he had lived uh, longer, because it was, it was under siege at the time he died. Uh, but he, did, he died in his bed, he didn't die on the battlefield. Uh, it's possible even that he died because of, because of a lack of nutrition uh, due to the fact that Valencia was under siege and so their food and medical resources were, were lacking. But, uh, but the point is, he was never defeated. He, he never died uh, on the battlefield. So from this history comes the, the material that will be adapted first in the oral tradition. First, this is going to be the subject of songs, just like every other text we've read, uh, or almost every other text we've read. It goes into the oral tradition first, uh, so there was some historical conflict and some historical characters, uh, but these become uh, adapted into narrative, and uh, in that narrativization process, a lot of things are changed. Now, we have a lot of sort of higher concepts, uh, take over and a lot of the specific facts are uh, uh, adapted, changed, uh, edited to fit the narrative goals of the, uh, the authors, the singers. And eventually this is, uh, whatever form these songs take, they're eventually sort of recombined into a single larger narrative in the, the Cantar de Mio Cid. Uh, so maybe these were three individual songs because we have in each third of the, the uh, the larger cantar is uh, referred to as a, a canto. You know, maybe each one of these was song uh, was uh, coherent and unified in its own. Maybe each of those is com uh, composed of lots of other songs. Uh, it's uh, the scholars uh, uh, debate that the same way they debate whether or not you know Beowulf came from lots of different uh, songs, whether the Iliad and the Odyssey came from lots of different songs and lots of different authors. But we have this interesting line at the end of the text. Uh, at the very end, in, uh, in, in the, the Burton Raphael uh, edition, it says on page 247, This is the tale of my Cid, the warrior, and here my story is done. May God grant paradise to the man who transcribed this book, Amen, written out by Parabat in the month of May, in the year of our Lord, 1207. So we have this document written in the year 1207, and it's written by someone referred to as Parabat, and we have a historical Parabat uh, shortly after this time who's a, a lawyer. And the fact that uh, Parabat is a lawyer and we have a lot of legal proceedings, uh, uh, almost a theme of uh, legal conflict resolution instead of battlefield conflict resolution or instead of uh, infighting and backstabbing, the kind of thing that had defined both the Muslim Taifa kingdoms and the, the Christian uh, kingdoms all the way back to the Visigoths. Uh, instead of you know getting revenge on each other, um, you uh, handle your your issues legally, even if it's a trial by combat. That would tend to indicate that this poem is very much structured by somebody with a uh, expertise in uh, uh, medieval Spanish uh, le uh, legality uh, law codes. But we don't know if this if Parabot was somebody who you know, took all of these uh, fragmented ideas and composed the poem itself, or if he's someone who adopted the poem as it already existed and just added a few things, added some interpolations. Uh, remember this term from Beowulf. Uh, or if this is just somebody who transcribed it because the, the line says, may God grant paradise to the man who transcribed this book. Now does that mean that 
uh, Parabot transcribed it from someone else, and remember, and transcribed is not translate, it's not write, it's not adapt, it is just say, uh, look at this text over on this document and write it down on this document. Uh, is that all Parabot did, or did Parabot have more creative control? Uh, we don't know. Uh, so we have a little bit more information uh, than we do with uh, a poem or work like Beowulf. Uh, this is very similar to the situation we were in with the uh, Atrahasis text. Uh, the last lines attribute it to uh, someone named Epic Aya. Well, is Epic Aya the, the author, or is he just someone who wrote it on this particular tablet? Uh, was he someone who was making creative adaptations to it, or was he someone who was just uh, writing down his uh, uh, his lessons, uh, this, which is the reason why we have so many of those uh, Atrahasis tablets, just like Gilgamesh, people uh, would practice writing uh, or transcribing uh, without actually adding anything themselves. Uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know how much creative control Parabot had. We don't know how long this poem had been in its present form before this manuscript was written. But we can tell that it has been shaped uh, with particular artistic goals in mind, and with particular political goals in mind. And your, uh, your edition, if you have the, uh, the Burton or Fell uh, translation, uh, that introduction written by Maria Rosa Minical, uh s compares this to like American Westerns, but also to other national epics, when she says, uh, the Cid has particularly strong kinship with other national epics that recount mythologized historical events believed to be vital to the formation of a people or a nation. Uh, central to many of these is an acting out of this passage from the almost wild universe of unruly frontiers and their attendant injustices into the new world, the new community, the new nation, where a newly crystallized society is instead governed by laws and where justice reigns. And so the, the frequent themes we see in, in Western movies and uh, old uh, novels from the 19th century is moving from the Wild West where uh, you know, it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, they kill one of yours, you kill one of theirs. Um, transition from that to legitimate uh, uh, third party or objective law enforcement uh, where a judge will decide you know, who's the aggrieved party and whether or not this, uh, uh, this other defendant is guilty or not. Uh, and that's very much a theme in the Song of the Cid. Uh, we have this guy who's unstoppable on the battlefield. He has been wronged by people. We see that he's been wronged. Uh, these guys are, you know, underhanded, uh, ignoble, even though they are the nobles. Um, and he could easily ride into Castile and defeat not only the Carrions, not only uh, Garcia Ordonez, but even King Alfonso himself. Uh, but he doesn't do that. Even when he has the opportunity, he tries to do things by appealing to justice, uh, by appealing to this, uh, the rule of law that uh, he sort of strengthens by obeying it, by not challenging it. And uh, so we have this sort of national epic, just like Virgil, took the, the content material of the Iliad and the Odyssey and made it very Roman by adding the ideal of pietas, of duty. So Aeneas isn't this sort of tricky figure the way Odysseus was, uh, he's somebody who has this very Roman virtue of uh, obedience to uh, the gods, obedience to his destiny, and uh, by extension to the, uh, the empire that he will eventually, uh, uh, that will come from his descendants. Uh, similarly, El Cid is, has his own sort of pietas, but it's not exactly pietas, it's uh, this patience, this willingness to uh, withhold revenge, uh, immediate action, in order to seek the best outcome for everybody, not just for himself. And by calling it an epic, uh, this uh, Minical's description leads us to recall the uh, definition of ep epic that we've used in the past. Uh, remember that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the Iliad, in the Odyssey, uh, in the Aeneid, our standard definition was that an epic was a, a long narrative poem written in an elevated style, presenting characters of high social rank and national importance, and adventures forming an organic whole through their re relation to a central heroic figure and through their development of episodes important to the history of a nation or people. Every one of these criteria, and most of the secondary characteristics as well, uh, this is maybe not a, a hero of imposing physical ability, but he's somebody whose you know, strategic ability uh, makes him uh, very important. He's obviously of historical uh, significance. Uh, he journeys over a, a wide geographic area. Uh, he overcomes constant conflict, and the supernatural forces are minimal, but remember the angel Gabriel appears to him in a dream and says, you will never be uh, defeated. 
Uh, so there is a, a, an element of, of supernatural intervention, but there's one very original innovation that this uh, poem will change that has been a constant through each thing we've read so far. And that is the character, the main character is not of the nobility. And that is a major element for the theme of this poem. He's not one of the uh, close relatives of the king. So even in the small chiefdoms, like in uh, the, the Anglo-Saxon and, and Norse and Danish worlds in, in Beowulf, Beowulf is uh, the nephew of one king and uh, he's, uh, you know, close relations with another king. He becomes a king himself. Uh, and, and of course, in uh, the Aeneid, uh, Aeneas is uh, not uh, one of the sons of Priam, but he's uh, a distant relation of the, the family. Odysseus is a king, Achilles is a king, Agamemnon's a king, uh, and of course, Gilgamesh is a king. Everybody's a king or noble. They're, they're part of this upper class and they're the only ones considered important enough to be the, the central protagonist of an epic. But El Cid is not. El Cid is born to the, the common class, the, the non-nobles. And this is something that's thrown in his face consistently by the, the lords of Carrion, uh, the Infantes of Carrion, by Don Garcinia uh, Ordonez and, and others. And this poem compares his nobility in the, the character sense. He's got the, the character traits, the patience. Uh, not only is he successful in war and financially successful, but he's also patient, kind to his men. Uh, uh, he's, he shows loyalty to the king even when the, the king is clearly a lesser man and the, the poet, uh, the narrator tells us as much that uh, a greater man was sent into exile by a lesser man. But this is a commoner who has all these characteristics that supposedly everybody up until that time thought only the nobles had. Whereas the nobles we see are underhanded, they're liars, they're backstabbers, and they're not even very good with uh, managing the money that they inherit or uh, fighting on the battlefield. These are the things that supposedly they're better at and they're clearly worse at everything. Uh, the only thing that they have more of than El Cid is arrogance. Uh, it's just this sort of self-righteous uh, uh, narcissism. And so all of these elements are clearly part of the, the cultural background uh, in which this romancero, this, uh, uh, these, these ballads are, are focusing. And then someone, whether it's Parabot or someone else, uh, combines them all into this uh, narrative that forces us to look at these different conflicts, these different identities, uh, these different uh, sort of philosophical issues that are relatively new to this uh, very uh, diverse uh, and an open society, but also a society that's given to constant conflict, uh, where different factions, different kingdoms are constantly in conflict, but now we see a lot of uh, old ideas that are coming into conflict with new ideas. Uh, and all of these things sort of um, form the, the texture, the fabric uh, that the, the various poets and, and singers that, that came before them uh, are, are weaving together in the Song of the Cid. And so uh, with the, the next uh, lecture, I wanna talk about uh, the characters' identities, uh, the larger sort of national religious identities, uh, and compare that to the individual uh, goals and how those goals come into conflict in the, the poem of the Cid.